All the settlement in this area started out along the Yakin River. Easy access, flatter land, very fertile land for um, growing crops. Most of them were farming. There was no industry here uh, at the time. And as more people came in, they started working their way up the creeks, including the Big Elkin Creek. As far as commerce back then, it was very important. It was a lifeline. I mean, without it, nothing works. Everybody had to have water power. We know that there were settlers here in the 1750s uh, because there were land grants issued. One settler from up north who came about 10 years later was a man named David Allen. He really, I guess, as far as we know at this point, was the first person to establish any sort of industry on the Elkin River. Yep, David Allen's where it all began. He arrived in the Elkin area in the 1760s from New Jersey. That great migration that came down from Pennsylvania and New Jersey, it also included uh, Squire and Sarah Boone and their son Daniel. Allen settled on the west side of the Yadkin River in what was Rowan County. It became Surrey County in 1771 and possibly included his home site, thought to be on what is now Hillcrest Drive and Highway 268 in Elkin at the Presbyterian Church. It's gotta be one of the largest trees, if not the largest and oldest tree in Surrey County is there in the church parking lot. And that tree is dated to before David Allen arrived, which is saying something. So the fact that that tree survived suggests that there was, it wasn't a plowed field. It was maybe a home at there, at that location or some other building. So it does suggest that that area has been a home site. And very possibly it could have been David Allen's land because he lived, he owned that property until 1785. He started buying his land, uh, amassed over 2,400 acres. He got land grants all around the Big Elkin. He got four of them, but the biggest two that were the important ones were on either side of the Big Elkin Creek. Where uh, there was always a supply of water, there was a good elevation drop. It's got about a 2,000 foot drop from the mountains to the, to the confluence with the Yadkin River. He, he noticed that the, the Big Elkin Creek regardless if it was a drought or whatever, always had water flowing. And he needed water for a hammer or a, a wheel to work in the, in, the, in the water there. And he noticed all the iron ore. You can see the, the dirt's red, the rocks are red, so he had a good eye for it. Allen got to work creating two businesses that were necessary for the time, a sawmill and ironworks. Great documentation in the Moravian records that people were coming here about 1766 to buy lumber initially. And it talks about it coming to Allen's settlement and buying, buying these supplies. Later, a few years later, in about 1776, they talk about coming to Allen's settlement to buy iron from his furnace. That was the first forge in northwestern North Carolina. Lumber was such a big part of the iron making process, you had to create heat had to burn that to make charcoal that was essential for the iron making procedure. So he may have just started that to clear the forest, selling the lumber as a side business in preparation for making iron later on, which he started within two or three years of his first mention in the Moravian records. In the records, they would mention that they would float the lumber down the Yakin River, where the Moravians would unload it and carry it the rest of the way to their settlement at Wachovia. And so the wood that came from Elkin is actually in the buildings, or some of the buildings that are in Old Salem or Bethania and Berthaber today. The location of his businesses was something of a mystery until old photos gave a hint of their whereabouts. They've zeroed in on where we think that that iron furnace was actually located, and it's a lot closer than we probably initially thought. So we had some archeologists come walk the site with us. From the pictures, that they see right below the uh, Galloway Memorial Church, there's this huge stone ring. And they said, oh gosh, look, a charcoal ring. That's where they would have burned the wood to get to the charcoal. And of course, that was right across from where we've identified within probably 20 yards, based on these old maps we've got, uh, that the forge was going upstream on the right-hand side. So he settled at the library, which 
is ironic that that's really the center part of town now and that over a hundred years before it even was incorporated as a town, that's where the first industry started. Another indication of the site is the amount of slag that is exposed after heavy rain still today. The slag is nothing more than the, the refuse that's made uh, when you produce iron. This is everything that's not iron, although there are at times bits of iron in these things. You can see by the, the uh, rusting effect on some of them that actually have iron in them. Each one tells its own story, like this one here. It's got a lot of iron in it, but it also has a lot of carbon. You can actually see the, the wood, uh, wood grain in uh, at least a dozen pieces here that have been trapped in time uh, from the 1770s or thereabouts. This piece of slag and this tool were found in the same location, just a few feet from each other, when the bank washed away and these were revealed. Uh, it's a piece of slag that would have been formed when he was making iron and it fits into this tool like that. So at the time he was using a tool like this or probably even this tool to dig the slag out of the uh, bottom of the furnace there and this one actually melted in place, uh, you know, left the imprint of the shovel there. 18th century records can tell us much of what David Allen accomplished in what would become Elkin. The rest has been left to speculation. We believe he was born in 1711 or 1712. So when he arrived in the 1760s, he was in his 50s. Which, during that time period, is an elder gentleman to be taking on a sawmill, which would have been all by hand, um, and again with ironworks all by hand. Um, that's, a, that's a rough business. If he was in the iron business, he had certainly already learned that before he left. And when he arrived here, he had at least two sons, probably several children. They helped. Um, both of them, all three of them, served in the American Revolution. So they were uh, involved with the community that they were forming. That included helping prepare the defenders of our young nation against British rule, however he could. Because Allen is, is producing iron, and unfortunately there's no paperwork to tell what it is. He's producing iron things that are important for the American freedom fighters that are around here. Uh, he's also made wagons and he's using his wagons to transport goods and transport prisoners to uh, Salisbury. They had an army company guarding it because the British Tories were coming in and trying to destroy things and they'd chase them down, chase them away. So that there was a the place we're looking at right there by the Elkin Dam, it was a manufacturing site, basically. That site was also used as the muster ground for the Surrey Militia before the Battle of Kings Mountain. And according to history, uh, three quarters of a mile uh, upstream of the forge of the ironworks. Allen was especially beneficial to the Surrey Militia that fought at the Battle of Kings Mountain in 1780. He helped supply the forces, and um, he was in, in several battles himself. The Moravian records mention David Allen being injured at a date that coincides with the Battle of Shalliford. He would, evidently took a wagon there to help the troops muster there. They talk about him being transported to them uh, in October when the battle took place, October 14th. Um, and he stayed there till mid-December. And then his son came, David Allen Jr. came from Allen's settlement by wagon and picked him up and brought him back home. We don't, they, didn't, they weren't elaborating on what that injury was, but um, it wasn't as bad as they thought it was at first. According, the only sentence or two that they wrote says that he wasn't as bad off as we at first thought he was. So that's good. And then just five years later, he said, I'm getting out of North Carolina, I'm going to Georgia. <laughs> Records indicate Allen's businesses and home were subject to arson. So in 1785, he sold everything and moved west with his son. It's assumed he never returned to the area, nor possibly ever knew of the impact he would have here. I think he's more important than most of us realized, even as we got started with this. When he was here, there was nothing established by the Europeans. There were no roads going to his place. The most common mention of David Allen in the old records is by the road orders, both in Wilkes and Surrey County. While the ironworks was operating, in order to get the iron to the people who wanted to buy it, 
a whole network of roads called Ironworks Roads were built. So many of these road orders say establish and maintain a road from somewhere to David Allen's on the Big Elkin or across the Yakin River at the Ford at the old Ironworks. Five total ones in 10 year period to get to Elkin and they're all circling around David Allen. Those roads then become Highway 268 East, Highway 268 West, Old 60, Highway 67, Highway 21, which are still being used today. It would seem Allen did know how his efforts to support the local militia that mustered here in what is now a park helped change the course of history for our country. The thing that to me is real important is the fact that Joseph Winston mustered those 150 or so troops and marched to the Battle of Kings Mountain, and which Thomas Jefferson called the success of which was the turning tide of the Revolutionary War. Could you have gone there? Who would have mustered? There would have been no point to get them here. And then again, without that, you kind of go way backwards, would have the Battle of Kings Mountain been won? We might be talking to King Charles today. I mean, uh, it was a turning point of the war right there. A lot of times people say, oh, one guy can't make a difference. In this case, he did. I mean, there are literally thousands of people on both sides of the river here because of what he started way back when. Um, so yeah, I, one man can make a difference. The Big Elkin Creek is very important because that brought him here and kept him here. It took a little over 50 years for another entrepreneur to take advantage of the site Allen used. In about 1840, Richard Gwynn resigned as postmaster from Jonesville. He moved across the river to what would become Elkin and built his home called Cedar Point, which that house still exists up on West Main Street today. But Richard Gwynn ended up with approximately 6,000 acres of land on the north side of the Edkin River, which encompassed all of the downtown area, all of where Chatham Manufacturing would later be built east of the town. And because of those land holdings, he saw the power of the river, I think. He wanted to harness that power, so the first thing he did in the early 1840s was to build a grist mill on the, on the Elkin Creek. He, looking over the Yakin River, eyed that land and must have seen opportunity. So he bought the old ironworks property, which is how it was worded even in 1839. And that set approximately where the library, Elkin Public Library, sits today. It was just a little bit behind that, we think. That was, we believe, within feet of the site where the furnaces were stationed at the ironworks. It was a smart location to choose, given that David Allen had already done much of the work for him. He didn't have to clear the land. He didn't have to create an infrastructure of roads. There was already a dam had been a dam on the Big Elkin Creek to support the ironworks, he most likely picked the same location for his larger dam that would have powered his uh, grist mill. And it wasn't long uh, after the grist mill was there, he, in about 1846, he built a small cotton mill adjacent to the grist mill. And he called it the Elkin Manufacturing Company. That industry stayed in that same location and was a cotton mill, as far as we know, up until at least 1903. It's kind of neat to think about that perhaps Richard Gwynn used some of the rock out of that furnace to make the foundations of the grist mill, or maybe the foundations of the Elkin Manufacturing Company cotton mill. Who knows? And then shortly thereafter, he built a little general store there as well. And it's interesting to note that the what was the office building for the cotton mill. It was later moved a couple times and used as the office building for the Elkin and Allegheny Railway. It's on West Main Street down here now, used as a little uh, bed and breakfast. That building is a remnant of the Elkin Manufacturing Company. 26 years later, progress was moving up Big Elkin Creek in the form of R.R. Gwinning Company. Right after the Civil War in 1866, Richard Gwynn's son, Richard Ransom Gwynn, buys the grist mill and moves it up the creek about a mile to the little community of Elkin Valley and starts a grist mill up there on the creek, builds another dam across the creek. 
1877 is the date. Younger brother, Thomas Lenore Gwynn, and brother-in-law, Alexander Chatham, buy R.R. R. Gwynn and Company. They expand it. They take a trip up north to Pennsylvania, meet a young man by the name of Gilvin T. Roth, who was a engineer. Gilvin Roth moves his family to Elkin. He really is, I think, more responsible than anybody for the early growth of the business. He goes and buys more equipment. He trains his staff. They enlarge the woolen process there. The community of Elkin Valley was thriving. I have a stamped envelope with a postmark that says Elkin Valley, North Carolina. And in 1890, T.L. Gwynn sells his interest in the Elkin Valley Woolen Mill to Alexander Chatham. In about 1893 or so, it's reorganized as Chatham Manufacturing Company. 1893 is important because that's when the new, more modern mill was built east of Elkin, down by the railroad tracks, which the railroad came to Elkin in 1890. So it was advantageous to move the mill closer to the railroad to take advantage of that. With Chatham now closer to downtown, the Elkin Valley Woolen Mill sat empty until Alexander Smith purchased the building and moved the Elkin Shoe Company there in 1896. They were famous for making what was called the Elkin Brogan Shoe. It was a high top leather shoe, uh, very plain, very simple. About 1900, they added on to what was the old woolen mill facility there. We're on the east side of the Elkin River, right there at the Shoe Factory Dam. So about 1908, the Elkin and Allegheny Railway was incorporated. By 1911, you had the first run of the railroad where the train started in Elkin, went up the east side of the creek. It stopped there at the Shoe Factory Dam because that's as far as the tracks went at the time. But because of the building of the railroad up through there, all those buildings up through Elkin Valley were torn down. And the only remnant then of what was once there is the dam. As the shoe factory began to grow in 1909, they built the larger brick factory on the west side of the creek where the water treatment plant is today. By 1914, the Elkin Shoe Company had roughly 90 employees and they were making over 400 pairs of shoes a day. They were shipping out 150 boxcar loads of shoes from Elkin per year. One interesting little note about the shoe factory, there was a gentleman named Noah Luffman who was a superintendent of the Elkin Shoe Company. We have a, a check stub from when he worked there in 1927 and he was a superintendent and part of his job was to lock and unlock the door of the Elkin Shoe Company every day. And we actually have the key to the door of the Elkin Shoe Factory. Each, each shoe was stamped with a little stamp that said Elkin Shoes, homemade, warranted. But after World War I, interest in that type of shoe waned and Alexander Smith eventually sold his interest in the business in 1924 to Thurman Chatham and Jim Haynes from Winston-Salem. They tried to modernize the shoe business a little bit and try to make more uh, styles that people would like of the day, but it didn't work out and so the shoe factory closed in 1927. Nearing the 20th century, a new form of power was being generated in Elkin, not by water, but by wood or coal. In 1914, a newspaper called the Elkin Industrial Edition stated that Elkin was the first town in the state of its size to have electric lights. The first electricity ever generated in the town of Elkin came from a generator in the Elkin Roller Mill. It was located along the railroad tracks behind where local folks would know where the Smithy's department store used to be down on East Main Street. And I have found out that Chatham Manufacturing had something to do with that because it was furnishing power for the mill and they might have had enough left over for a few homes in that general area. Later the plant was moved near the cotton mill site on Big Elkin Creek to utilize water power once again. In 1912 it was sold to the Elkin Ice and Light Company but they could only offer electricity to homes from 7 to 11 in the evening. The people of Elkin wanted more. Carter Falls is about four miles north of Elkin along the Big Elkin Creek. It had been a destination site for picnics and a, a tourist area, a local tourist area for before 1900. But 1914 they decided, okay, let's take advantage of this water power and they built a dam 
up at the top of Carter Falls. Along with that, they built more or less an aqueduct down the east side of the river. It was several feet wide. It was made of, of large boards banded together with these metal straps, and it was a flume that carried water from the dam atop Carter Falls down to the bottom of the falls to where the dynamo was housed in some type of building to furnish electricity through that generator. They ran power poles and wire for four miles from there all the way to Elkin, and that was the first significant power uh, I would say source that really powered the town of Elkin. 1915, there's a newspaper clipping that says that the power mill generated power for Elkin. And when they first turned it on, that the folks in Rhonda, six miles away, were afraid that Elkin was on fire <laughs> because they saw this bright red glow at night when they're not used to seeing that. In the 21st century, water is no longer necessary for power in Elkin. Instead, we can simply enjoy its beauty while remembering the power and all the history it created. The forges, mills, and factories are gone from the banks of the Big Elkin Creek, and in their place are fantastic walking and riding trails. We started on the Elkin and Allegheny Rail Trail because there was already a big mound of dirt that could carry a train and we built on top of that rail trail the first few miles and all the other trails have spun out from that. It's all part of the can-do spirit that's been here for over 250 years and how it's still helping prepare future generations for the next chapter of Elkins history.